Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host today, speaking with Dr. Philip Blair. Colonel Philip MD is a family physician and a consultant in cannabis medicine. Today, we would like to talk about how the endocannabinoid system, a master hormone and metabolic regulator, can impact all body systems and particularly to learn how the ECS system impacts our eating behaviors and food addiction. So Dr. Philip Blair graduated from West Point in 1972 and University of Miami School of Medicine in 1978. Then he trained in family medicine and then served as an American combat physician in 1991 Gulf War. He has been treating, consulting, and lecturing on the subject of non-psychoactive cannabidiol since 2014. In 2021, he co-authored the Medicinal Cannabis and CBD in Mental Health Care, And in 2022, he created BC Plus, a unique oral non-cannabis ECS activator, which he claims is a powerful regulator of immunity, neurotransmitters, and metabolism. He is currently the CEO of Blair Medical Group, CPS, providing endocannabinoid-enhancing products internationally. As well, he has a consultant practice for people who wish to restore health and performance by enhancing their ECS through lifestyle, medications, and non-psychoactive herbs. And if you want to learn more about his work, he has 50 YouTube videos available online. So after all of that, welcome, Philip. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you. Well, so we always start our questions with the personal and really begs the question here, how did you as an army surgeon get interested in cannabis? Well, I was looking for, well, I joined a company that was doing innovative work uh, in uh, dietary measures for chronic kidney disease. And with them, I worked with the dietitians. And the dietitians taught me so much about the body and things that I had not learned about dietary connections to disease. And I worked with them for a considerable amount of time. And I realized that there was much more to medicine than the drugs that we were prescribing. And recognizing that, I got very interested in cannabidiol in 2014. I was introduced to it. I studied it. I was amazed at the properties of it, the fact that it was a food product and it had so many benefits. I was really taken up front by it. And I started devoting myself uh, to that in particular. And I worked with a company for six years in exploring that. And I've evolved into an understanding, a pretty good understanding of the endocannabinoid system, but it continues to evolve. And more recently, I've developed a new product that works on the endocannabinoid system, but it doesn't come from cannabis. And so that's beta carry off lane. So I don't have any particular issues that are bothering me that are uh, except for, you know, chronic pain, aches and dietary measures and, you know, the usual things that bother people. I don't have any particular addictions or uh, any type of complaint that have brought me into this field. It's just my desire to help people to mitigate against the disease and the suffering that I see all around me. There must be a mindset against that in the end. Well, you know, it's, it's, it is a mindset. And I used to test people for cannabis and I would fire them essentially for using <laughs> cannabis at one time. And, and here I are one. Uh, now I'm, I'm a cannabis user and a cannabis physician, but it is more a matter of recognizing that the whole science has been neglected terribly. We've been misinformed of, about these uh, valuable natural food products that can change our lives. And and rather than devoting ourselves to pharmaceuticals, I find that pharmaceuticals tend to be like magic bullets. They target one particular aspect of care and one particular receptor systems, and they leave the others off. 
Whereas the body is really a complex system and it requires more than one receptor to mitigate against the disease. So there's, there's not one cause of Alzheimer's disease. There's numerous causes and there's numerous causes of diabetes. And so you've got to address all of the causes or at least consider the homeostasis of the individual and the problems to get to a true solution. Let's just get, start with the basics. Tell us what you can, I don't know, a paragraph or so, what the endocannabinoid system is and how it relates to brain function. I mean, it affects the whole body. So can you just start from the basics? Sure. The endocannabinoid system is a combination of receptors and ligands that interface with all of the other body systems to regulate the amount of neurotransmitters, the amount of immunity, the amount of hormones, the amount of metabolism that's going on. So it's almost like a translation system that is set up. And it it has a master regulator for all of these systems. So it has this peculiar interface with the rest of the body, and it does integrate with all other systems in the body. So a natural endocannabinoid system, what kinds of functions does it do? And then you might want to get into talking about what the CB1 and CB2 receptors are. Sure. The the endocannabinoid system is composed of ligands and receptors, but it's also composed of the enzymes that formulate and break down these ligands and transport molecules that generate. And there's also genes that actually generate these neurotransmitters. So that becomes this complex entourage of systems that are involved with this entire endocannabinoid system so that it regulates almost all aspects of our health. It regulates particularly immunity. It regulates neurotransmitters. It affects our appetite. It affects our mental status. It affects sleep. It affects digestion. It has effects on the microbiome on the gut transmission, on the muscle activities, you know, and kidney function and pancreatic and liver function. All these functions have at their core a regulator uh, in the endocannabinoid system that controls some of the uh, effects of the other systems that come into it. For instance, if we're taking in a, a diet that is adverse to us, then that activates different receptor systems within the body. And the endocannabinoid system is one of those. It's a cannabinoid type one receptor is activated and that leads to inflammatory signals to the body. Whereas if you have the cannabinoid type two receptor is one that is on one, every one of our immune cells and it regulates inflammation. By activating this receptor, we turn off inflammation and we turn it to a healing phase. We go from the M1 phase which is the inflammatory phase to the M2 phase, which is a healing and resolution phase of the body. Okay, so the CB1 receptor, that's the immune receptor, governs our immune system? The the CB1 receptor is the one that it makes us high, that gives us the psychoactive effects, but it also is related to a lot of pain. It has control of, and it's co-located with opioid receptors, so it controls pain, but it also controls the inflammatory signals in the brain and throughout the rest of the body. Okay, so that's the CB1, and then what's the CB2? CB2 is on every one of our immune cells. Whatever location in the organ systems contains a CB2 receptor, and activation of that receptor shifts the immune system to a more healing phase and a lack of inflammatory signals that go into the body. And that includes uh, for all of the immune cells and includes uh, polymorphonucleosites and macrophages, and it actually decreases the populations of those and the cytokines that they produce. Now, there are other receptors in the system, in the endocannabinoid system, but these are vague and they're not well-defined at this point in time. And there's also other endocannabinoids that we hear about. The the endocannabinoids, I really haven't spoken about it. One is AEA, and another was 2AG. A third one is palmitoyl ethanolamide, and a fourth one is oleol ethanolamide. And the last two are items that we can get over the counter to stimulate our endocannabinoid system. Those four things, what are they actually? They're lipid-like molecules that signal the body in particular ways. AEA works on the cannabinoid type 1 and type 2 receptors. 
And the 2AG works in the endocannabinoid type 1 and type 2 receptors, but with a stronger interaction. And endomide is another name for it. That's AEA. Okay. So those are our natural ones that we make ourselves that mm-hmm. go to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And right. they together, along with ligands, create this endocannabinoid system. That's they natural. are the ligands that connect to the receptor systems. And they also connect with other receptors that are, but the, we're not talking specifically about those other receptors right now. So palmitoyl ethanolamide is another compound that is derived from uh, substances in the body and special lipids in the body, and it has particular properties and signaling properties as well. It doesn't work on the cannabinoid type 1 and type 2 receptors, but it works on other links to the endocannabinoid system. And the same is true for oleol ethanolamide. And these are compounds that have particular value in sleep, in digestion, in appetite control, and metabolism. So we have an opioid system, we have a dopamine system, a serotonin system, but then we have this endocannabinoid system of which we don't know very much about, but we're learning more and more. And it sounds to me like what you're saying is that it is actually a regulator of those systems that I've just mentioned, that it's almost like above kind of controlling. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's been considered the master regulator. Yes. Okay. And then based on, before we get into the external ways to stimulate the system, we have our own endocannabinoid, anandamide, et cetera, that will be stimulated based on foods or... Right. And our dietary measures will stimulate them, our exercise, our sleep. It maintains... The whole point of the system is to maintain a homeostasis, to keep us a balance and to keep us out of dysregulation, which leads to chronic diseases. And that's what one of my major themes is, And when we get the endocannabinoid system out of balance, then we are led towards chronic diseases. Okay. I would like you to actually walk us through one example of a chronic disease, maybe depression or anxiety. So in depression, there appears to be more and more relationship to inflammation and to metabolism involved with depression. I mean, it could be related in depth uh, to combination of inflammation caused by metabolic issues. And this somebody gets into this metabolic situation and they create inflammatory molecules from this dysregulation. And then these inflammatory molecules are uh, derogatory in terms of the endocannabinoid system, which controls for many of the neurotransmitters that are involved. And mm-hmm. so you get a disruption of serotonin and dopamine as a result of these neurotransmitters being misregulated. And by using the cannabinoids, the phytocannabinoids, like uh, CBD or beta-caryophyllin, you can control and bring those levels of neurotransmitters to a normal level and regress that particular problem with anxiety and depression. And that would be by focusing on that CB1 or enhancing the CB2, which is the healing one. That's right. Now, I didn't mention that the CB2 receptor is also located in every one of our nerve cells. It's just not the same population. And it it also has a very controlling factor for our emotions, our sleep, our appetite, our general well-being as well. So the CB2 receptor is on our nerve cells, and it's also working on the immune system. Can you give any specifics about how, how can foods such as sugar or processed food affect this system? in a negative way or in a dysregulatory way? Sure. So one sugar actually contains glucose and sucrose. By taking in a high sugar diet over a period of time, we actually create an inflammatory situation that stimulates excessive CB1 receptor agonism. And those excessive CB1 receptors tend to be associated with inflammation, inflammation in the lipid, in the liver, and the adipose tissue. Um, and they that's, also, the thing, that's the same thing as saying insulin resistance, right? That's a contributor to insulin resistance. It, it is related to insulin resistance. And in fact, when you put blockers to the CB1 receptor, then you can restore insulin functionality to the body. Has this got anything to do with the term endocannabinoid tone? Yes, well, we're talking about the tone, that we're talking about the balance. So I said that earlier that we have the ligands and we've got the receptors. 
And these are balanced. And when they're balanced, then we are in a state of homeostasis. If they get too many receptors, then that may mean that there's an inflammatory situation and we need more agonists in order to activate those receptors and bring it back to normal. Okay. So you talked about how depression can be, I guess, basically a consequence of an inflammatory condition. What about addiction? What would you say about that? Specifically sugar addiction, but any addiction. Well, addiction has to, it goes through central areas of the brain that deal with uh, the pleasure principle. And that pleasure principle tends to be exacerbated. And we also get stimulation for those pleasure principles by glucose, for instance, and sugar will stimulate those pleasure centers and actually prevent, they actually stimulate the dopamine release and give us a high effect when we, in a pleasurable sense of addiction with that. Well, what happens with the cannabinoids, either beta caryophylline or CBD, is it blocks that addictive effect and it prevents the release of dopamine. So we don't get this extreme pleasurable situation from it. Well, what's happening before we talk about the externals, just what's happening with the dysfunction of our own internal endocannabinoid system. When we put sugar in excess into our body, what's happening to that system? Is You're that- stimulating CB1 receptors, and that's creating an inflammatory situation on the body, everywhere in the body, in the liver, in the adipose tissue, and in the brain. By taking too much sugar, we're actually producing fructose, and fructose can also have a negative impact on energy that maligns our ability to handle the uh, interactions of the body. Okay, and so then the endocannabinoid system is becoming dysregulated, and then how is that impacting dopamine? Because well, it loses its ability to regulate those neurotransmitters. It's there, it's present, and the ligands, the AEA and the 2AG, the ligands, are not being released in adequate quantities to control that receptor and to balance out the situation. And the control of those ligands and the receptors are to control the release of those neurotransmitters. And when we lose that balance, then we're not getting the release and we're not getting the regulation of those neurotransmitters. For instance, in epilepsy, we get a high level of uh, glutamate and there's a glutamate toxicity that occurs. And that's from a dysregulation of the glutamate material, the neurotransmitter. Whereas if you put cannabidiol or even THC in it, you will regulate the release and the control of the amount of glutamate in the body, and you'll control for the seizure episode and the neurotoxicity that causes. Right. So, I mean, I guess a summary way to say this is that the endocannabinoid system is like a gatekeeper, create homeostasis or an evenness across the whole system. So it's all working well. I think that's a good metaphor. Yeah. And junk food, processed food will dysregulate. But there's more than that. There's more than just foods. It's, it's yeah. a matter of lifestyle dysregulation. It's okay. a sleep. It's exercise. It's diet. There's rest and there's social interactions. These are all factors in restoring and maintaining the endocannabinoid system. So it's a lifestyle issue entirely. Yeah. Okay. But there is something special about food with the endocannabinoid system, because we know that when people smoke pot, they get the munchies. So there's something about the endocannabinoid system and appetite. Can you tell us like, what is it about that, that especially when you introduce an external, it gets really enhanced? Well, if you're smoking and you're taking THC, then you're stimulating the CB1 receptor, which also stimulates the uh, desire for food and the, the processing of that desire and the appetite stimulation. And that goes along with other things as well. It, it can relate to food. It can be related to emotional aspects as well. Anything that dysregulates that CB1 or allows it to go more than it should will create dysregulation, one of those things being an overeating capacity. That's right. And overeating actually stimulates more CB1 receptors, which makes Ah. it more sensitive, and we have more desire and appetite. Using that line of thinking, this might explain why when a person eats sugar, they just want more sugar. It almost sounds like if I smoke marijuana, or, or THC specifically, that stimulates the CB1, as does sugar. So in a way, they're both doing the same mechanism, aren't they? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. But it's only a temporary measure and it's only temporarily satisfied. And you go back to having tolerance. And when you get developed tolerance, then you need more in order to get that same benefit. And if your 
the center of your brain that's handling the desire nature and the satisfaction is telling you you need more uh, dopamine yes. and they want to get more satisfied and you want to get more release then you're going to have to take more of the cannabis in or the more of the sugar in now what about some people have argued that just obesity itself might be a factor that something about obesity and the cb1 receptors that there's a connection there what do you say about that well, obesity is characterized by a high number of CB1 receptors that are yes. located in throughout the body through the liver and the adipose tissue, particularly in the adipose tissue. And that generates an inflammatory signal to the body, which is why obesity is associated with high levels of inflammatory molecules. Okay, so this is all, in a sense, we could really narrow this down to this is a CB1 dysregulation issue. Can eating high fat also dysregulate that CB1 receptor? You know, there's a lot of discussion now about what kind of fat can be causing it. Now, eating fat alone will not cause it, but combine sugar and fat, yes. then you accelerate this condition. You can accelerate the abnormalities with regard to the CB1 receptor. Okay, so you wouldn't make the argument for fat alone, but high sugar and high fat. No, in fact, in so fact, uh, omega-3s and omega-6s are talked about in B in ratio. A one to four ratio would, would be ideal. One molecule of omega-3 and four molecules of omega-6s in that balance, it actually maintains an anti-inflammatory state. And it feeds in uh, certain lipid molecules into an inflammatory system that regulates the inflammation. If we get too much omega-6s, then we are go down an inflammatory pathway, which has to do with the ar arachidonic acid. And this turns into inflammatory substances that release an inflammation as well. Now, the debate about saturated fats and yeah. polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats uh, remains to be ex explored and defined, although, you know, there's lots of arguments for one way or the other. So one more question about this around food. What about volume? Do some people, like we have experienced in the clinical world, struggle with eating a lot. And is, is it possible that high volume alone may have an impact as well on the endocannabinoid system? Well, high volume is, if you're, you're eating high volume, you're probably eating high volume of glucose or carbohydrates. And carbohydrates appear to be the problematic factor in dietary interventions. You can get a high sugar and a high fat level, and that can produce problems. Protein is probably neutral in terms of its generation of any adverse effects on the body. But the fat and the sugar, and I'm of the belief that the sugar is the major problem in that it uh, generates uh, fructose and even if the body is not taking in fructose if, with a high carbohydrate diet, we have a sorbitol pathway that generates fructose. And so a person who is obese has high levels of fructose, and this is an anti-metabolite substance in the body. It actually is used by animals for hibernation and going into a quiet state and they turn off their metabolism as well. They decrease their amount of energy that they produce, and they go for storage. And that means they're going to store fat in that process. And so I believe that a high levels of carbohydrates can adversely affect the body, and they will generate appetite. Whereas high levels of fat in the diet, low levels of carbohydrate do not generate appetite, and they satisfy the cravings, and they don't speak to any additional cravings for foods. In summary of this little bit that we've talked about, it sounds like the dysregulation of the ECES, the endocannabinoid system, can really be understood from the context of there's something going on with the CB1, CB2 receptors. There's not a, an appropriate balance. Typically, the CB1 is enhanced or overstimulated. And so it sounds, let's talk about treatment now. What we want to do is either suppress the CB1 or enhance the CB2 to get the balance correct. Is that right? That's about right. That's okay. a pretty good explanation. So then let's talk treatment. I know you have a product that's non-psychoactive, but let's talk about what everybody knows, which is the psychoactive. I want to end with your product because it's unique in that it's non-psychoactive. Can you elaborate a little bit on the difference on that and which would be the better treatment? Sure. If we're talking about phytocannabinoids, and I include all of them that stimulate the endocannabinoid system, and that includes many oral nutritional cell elements like I talked about, palmitoyl ethanolamide or oleol ethanolamide, 
are endocannabinoids, but they still are in the category of a endocannabinoid modulator. So when we're talking about polyphytocannabinoids, we're talking about THC. Now, THC has an effect on the CB1 and CB2 receptors of the body, but mainly it's on the CB1 receptor in the activating that. And that relieves pain and it relieves a great deal of anxiety and it puts people into a neutral state and they don't have to think about many problems, but it also leads to a number of irregularities and there's a tolerance effect as well as uh, THC actually downregulates the endocannabinoid system. So it, it puts it into a quiet mode. It actually causes an imbalance uh, to the endocannabinoid system. Hey, Food Junkies listeners. We're just going to take a quick break here to share with you something our team thinks could help benefit your recovery with food, body, or self. Thank you again for listening. Hey, Food Junkie listeners. Have you read the book, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction yet? It all starts there. This is the book with the basic theory and clinical knowledge of food addiction. Read this book first to get the basics. Our Food Junkies podcast jumps off from the book and is the ongoing breathing version, ever growing and ever expanding. Our podcast introduces you to all the issues of food addiction and the who's who of food addiction today. And if we at the Food Junkies podcast have inspired you to action, either to quit sugar or some other triggering foods or behavior, and you need some extra support, then please join the free Facebook group, I'm Sweet Enough Sugar Free for Life. There you will find a community of people who come from all parts of the spectrum, from the new and just starting out, to the long timers who call themselves food addicts in recovery, to counselors ready to give back and help you. The Facebook group even offers free support Zoom groups. Basically, it's a great online living resource of food addiction to help you stay sugar-free for life. So please join us. Now back to the show. If you have enjoyed this episode, please let us know. We love to hear from you. Kindly leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to our podcast on. We love getting feedback from our listeners. It's been my experience in, I'm an addictions physician, and when people are coming off of cannabis, just smoking pot, they often experience symptoms that to me look an awful lot like an endorphin, like an opiate withdrawal. It's not as dramatic. They don't want to eat. They can't sleep. They're very agitated. It's not like a cocaine withdrawal or an alcohol withdrawal. And it just makes me wonder, what's the connection between the endocannabinoid system and the endorphin system? They both treat pain. Is there something behind the most that? In the brain, the most uh, highly localized area of CB1 receptors is with the mu opioid receptors. Wow. So they actually are in partnership. They're in uh, partnership. In cases. Yeah. So that would explain why the pain relief on both ends. Right. And also the tolerance effect that can occur. Right. And the withdrawal when the person stops, they're highly agitated. And yeah. Now, the other phytocannabinoid that is more prominent is CBD. And CBD has minor levels of uh, engagement for the CB1 receptor. It actually, on the CB1 receptor, it actually works as a somewhat as a antagonist. So it decreases the action of CB1. On the CB2 side, it has a weak agonist for the CB2 receptor. But in addition to this, it has dozens and dozens of other connective links to the rest of the body and other receptor systems throughout the body and throughout the system. And it also works on anti-inflammatory effects. It has antioxidants, and it works on a number of inflammatory receptor systems to calm those areas and bring the body at peace. It has a tendency to raise the function in a balanced manner to the endocannabinoid system. So by its measures, it actually blocks some of the degradating enzymes involved with the endocannabinoid system, and that allows them to stick around longer and maintain their levels of natural level for the improvement of all systems in the body. So that sounds really good, but I have two concerns. One is, is it really true that there's no psychoactive effect of a CBD? Well, it all depends on how specific you want to get. There's no psychotic episodes from CBD, but it does cause a relief of, it causes a mood 
improvement, and that could be con considered psychoactive. So if it's a relieving depression, and it's a relieving anxiety, and it's improving your mood, that would be a psychoactive effect, um, and that cannot be negated. You want to keep that in mind, but oftentimes we talk about the non-high of CBD. Yes, that's right. It does actually affect mood. So if that's the case, why are we not worried about tolerance, in which case ultimately you'll need more to get the same effect? In fact, there, there's actually a reverse tolerance with CBD, whereas if you take it over time, you find that you'd require less in order to have the same effects. How does that work? Do you know the mechanism behind that? I've never I, heard I believe that. it has to do with the uh, interference of on the degradation enzymes. And so you're preventing the endocannabinoid level from dropping. And it's not specifically the CBD molecule that is providing all of the benefit. It's an indirect effect with the CBD molecule rather than a direct agonist effect on a receptor. So you're getting an indirect effect. You're raising the function of the entire endocannabinoid system, and you don't have a direct effect. So if you're using CBD for a while, you have a leveling of the endocannabinoid system, a balanced effect, and then you're going to be able to come into better alignment and repair a dysfunctional system that could be the cause of the illness. In which case, ultimately, you may no, no longer need to rely on that drug. That's right. Okay. Are you an advocate for using not cannabis per se, but CBD? Yes, I'm a strong advocate for CBD. So now you have your own product, which is... It's beta caryophylline. Beta caryophylline is a terpene, which is a type of oil that is an essential oil that has been found in thousands of plants, herbal plants, that have been of great value to the world in for generations and generations and millennia. In particular, it's found in oregano, in basil, in cinnamon, in cloves. It's actually found in grapefruit and guava, and it's also found in hemp. And it's available in hemp in small quantities, and it seems to have uh, benefits in hemp, but it also has independent benefits. And what I've learned is that the beta caryophylline has unique endocannabinoid modulating effects that are mirror the CBD in particular and give a great deal of relief by targeting specifically the CB1 receptor in a strong agonism. Right. I extrapolate from that that just eating more cinnamon or eating more cloves would actually create an endocannabinoid effect? Yes, and it's been studied, and you have had that effect. But you have to take in like 200 milligrams in order to get the effects. Studies have been done on women in particular that were looking for, I think it was a pain syndrome. It was an, an eating disorder, actually. And they used uh, 100 milligrams of uh, beta caryophylline in, in an oral fashion. Now, it seemed to mitigate against many of their symptoms, but it didn't really change their weight in any amount. Uh, but that was 100 milligrams. A normal dosage is anywhere from 50 to 200 milligrams as a daily dose, and that could be corrective for many types of problems. But that would be microdosing. If you're in an acute situation, you may want to get some highly bioavailable beta caryophylline, and that's what my product offers. And so just for comparison's sake, cinnamon that you can just buy anywhere, you say you'd have to eat a lot of that. So how much would you have to eat of that to get equivalent to what you're going to be suggesting in a minute? You know, I can't tell you that particular fact. I don't know that. Uh, but it would have to, you're saying it would have to be a lot. You'd have to get in like 200 milligrams a day in order to get that level. Okay. But I've, there's essential oils that are out there. doTERRA offers a copaiba oil, which has a significant amount of beta caryophylline in it. And there's uh, other companies who are offering some essential oils. And you can actually get some other oils that contain caryophylline in like rosemary contains caryophylline, and you can put that into a vaporizer and emit that particular smell. And so, oh. in, in fact, there have been some studies to show that vaporizing these compounds has a particular benefit to people's well-being. Yeah, well, that's what they claim to do. And so essentially, they're working on the endocannabinoid system. Right. That's but they're working on much other, many other systems. The, yeah. the number of connections for like cannabidiol and beta caryophylline are enormous. It's got a, at least 100 different connections on the body. And it regulates genes, it regulates neurotransmitters, as well as metabolic enzymes. The a range of interactions is complex and cannot be singled out in any one way. 
So beta caryophyllenes, these are in these herbs like rosemary and cinnamon and cloves. Sometimes plants have these ingredients as toxins to protect themselves from predators that will eat them. Well, most of the time, in the case of beta caryophyllene, it's not something that's toxic to the other insects that are involved yeah. with it, but it deters them from being involved, or it actually attracts a predator of that insect, or let's say a wasp that lays an egg on the worm that is attracted to the plant. But plants signal with beta caryophyllene all the yeah. time. It's it's one of the most prevalent signaling, and it can signal a lack of water or a infestation by other plants. Whereas, in fact, beta caryophyllene has been extensively studied for safety. It's actually FDA approved as a food flavoring and has enormous a number of the studies, including some studies in animals showing that it actually does not cause any harm in the fetus as well. Okay, so the beta caryophyllene is... It's a signal, but it's not necessarily a toxin. No, it's not dangerous to us. Um, it, it, they've used uh, huge amounts in rats, and they've not come into any toxicity okay. uh, at all. Um, and it's been safe for all measures of people, all measures of pets, all measures of animals. And it has no toxic effect in thousands of studies. I'm reminded of when I was a teenager and people would say, you know, obviously, if you smoke pot, you get high. They say, well, if you can't get pot, smoke oregano, smoke something else. So they weren't really off the mark then. Well, I think they're probably right. I think frankincense is a psychoactive substance that could be used in that regard. And it has been used in ancient times. That's very interesting. Okay, so it's not just cannabis. It's potentially all other plants. And it just depends on how concentrated, I guess, the substance is. Well, and I don't know what mechanism that the other plants are using. I don't know what oregano would be. I know that oregano has certain medicinal properties, yeah. um, but I don't know what it would affect uh, it would have. It would not have any um, uh, CB1 effect, so it wouldn't make you high in that sense. But there are other receptor systems that could make you high. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, let's go back to your product specifically. Called it comes from, my product comes from cloves and hops. I, I have two different products. One is the essential oil, and that comes from hops. And then the biologic and the oral product is a liposomal. And the liposomes are a molecular style, and it, it's encapsulated in a small uh, molecule that is very bioavailable, gets absorbed through the mucous membranes very well, and it resists gastric acid, gets into the gut, gets well absorbed, and it goes through the mucous membranes to be well absorbed. It goes right into the bloodstream, goes right to the brain and gets immediate effects on the body. And it enhances that CB2, which is what we want. But it also works as an antioxidant, an anti-inflammatory, and it's also signaling some other receptor systems. So, you know, we talk about the CB2 receptor being an anti-inflammatory, but it also has neurogenic capabilities. And so on the mood and on PTSD, we know that it has benefits in that regard. And so within 10 minutes of use of this product, most people feel a calming, a relaxation. They get mobility in their joints. They get a mood lift. They'll change their voice, their breathing pattern. They will improve their eyesight within 10 minutes of use of the product. And I can't explain how that works entirely, uh, but I, I know it's neurotransmitters. It's gotta be neurotransmitters and the anti-inflammatory effect and the antioxidant effect all come into fruition. Okay, and if there is such a drastic, I'm this is playing the devil's advocate, if there is such a drastic response, like within 10 minutes, aren't you worried that the brain will have a... I would have thought so too. Yes. There isn't. No. If it doesn't happen. There is no, no tolerance. There's no tolerance effect uh, on beta Um uh, it, it has a balanced effect um, and... If you, you, if you take too much, you can feel drowsy and you can feel tired. But that's about the only uh, ill effect that I've seen from it. Okay. And you're saying that this is already FDA approved. So it's not something that we have to question the quality of the product or... Well, now I want to qualify that. beta caryophylline is FDA approved as a food additive. So it's been approved all through the system. It's my product has not been specifically approved by the FDA. Because it has a different function. Well, when you say food product, what do you mean then specifically? Like, how is it used as a food product? Well, as a food product, it's a supplement. And so you're using it in addition to whatever you're eating, whatever you're taking in. It's a nutrient and it's a supplement in that regard. You take calcium and it's yeah. the same thing as taking calcium. 
okay. or magnesium. Now, I talked about it as a particular agent on its own, and people can take it and get all the benefits of CBD by taking beta caryophylline, but they can also enhance the effect of CBD with a beta caryophylline. So the two in combination creates an enhancing and a highly beneficial effect. Now, that's been true for ischemic disease, for pain, and for cancer. There is a tolerance effect. Was it to CBD or was it to just THC? Tolerance effect to THC only. Only, not CBD. So you can take CBD all the time and not worry about any tolerance. That's right. I I haven't seen any problems from taking CBD all the time. People don't like the effects of CBD. They get a little bit of anxiety with it. And then some autistic children have been on CBD for a while. And as they mature, they get into an irritability standpoint and they don't do well with it over time, in which case I believe that beta caryophylline could control that effect. And by putting them two together or using beta caryophylline, they could restore balance for the autistics who are having irritability with respect to CBD. Or presumably you could just, maybe not for autistic, but for the regular person who gets anxious, just give them the beta caryophylline. Well, and I would recommend just starting with one. If that yeah. wasn't enough, then go ahead and use the CBD. But you have to, you know, with any of the cannabinoids, the dosing is quite individualized. And yeah. so the general statement is start low and go slow. I agree with that. But with beta caryophyllene, because of its benign nature, I recommend that people move up quickly. If they don't respond to a single dose, which is typically a half a milliliter or 15 milligrams, and I ask them to double the dose immediately and check them out within 10 minutes. And about 90% of people will have a positive response within 10 minutes of that second dose, if that's necessary. Okay, and so now let's just bring this to our population here. If somebody's struggling with food cravings, sugar cravings, would this be helpful? Well, one of the things that beta caryophylline is unique is that it has all of the benefits of ketones. So ketones are come about as a result of intermittent fasting, we elevate our ketone level. And you know, those ketones have lots of signaling properties on our metabolism, on our inflammatory cycles, on our appetite. They have all enormous number of benefits and energy. Beta caryophylline mirrors all of those and mimics all of those benefits. So there's an appetite suppression that's automatic. There is a metabolic changes in the mitochondria where you're getting increased number of mitochondria and they're producing more energy. There's a browning of fat. So your white fat shifts to brown fat, creates uncoupling proteins that actually disconnect the energy so that energy creates heat rather than um, actually reactive oxygen species or inflammatory molecules. It's also changing our gut. It's changing our microbiome and it's reducing inflammation all over the place. So you get enormous potential for fasting mimicry in the use of beta caryophylline. And I've seen people lose 10 to 15 pounds within a few weeks of starting beta caryophylline. Now that doesn't happen for everybody, but there are select people that it works very, very well for. And do you know the mechanism? That's very interesting. The mechanism behind beta caryophylline and ketones. Like how does, do you know how that works? Well, yeah, it has to do with the PPAR receptors. PPAR receptors are nuclear receptors on the body and in our metabolic cells and all our cells. And these are nuclear receptors create a cascade of RNA molecules that orchestrate metabolism and also inflammation. And so by activating this PPAR receptors in a positive way, and that's where caryophyllin is unique because it activates both PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma, which are the key receptors, and activates them both for a stimulation for appetite control, anti-inflammatory, and ketone uh, formation, as well as uh, metabolic improvement. Okay. Your product. Tell us a little bit about how we can get... So I have it on, on the website. I'm looking for distributors everywhere to market it. I have it wholesale. I have it retail. I have it white label. But I offer it on my website at uh, blairmedicalgroup.shop, and you can go there and you can pick out a product. Now, if you're calling, if you're contacting me from Canada, then there's extra requirements uh, for importation or labeling that has to go with that, and there's some additional costs for it. But otherwise, it's a shipping fee of about $10. Let me tell you about the different products I have. I actually offer four beta-caryophylline products. 
One is the liposomal, which is the oral version. Then I have the tincture, which is the pure oil, comes in 30 milliliters, and you just put three to five drops on the, the skin where you have pain or or if you want to get the systemic effects. And then I have a gel form that is a superb. It relieves neuropathy very, very quickly. And then I've got a crunch, uh, which is a one centimeter cookie, which is a tasty addition for pets, for children, and for anybody who wants a little bit of an extra kick. Does it have sugar in it? No, it's got monk fruit. All right, right on. And I can give it to my dog. Yes. That's very... I mean, typically, the dogs uh, the dogs respond to beta carotene quite well. They, it can either calm them down, give them a sedated effect if you give it enough, and it'll change their personality quite a bit to being more social. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, you know, one of the particular things that I've noticed, it, and, and I'm experimenting with it now, is using the topical form as an anti a glucose control measure. I've seen uh, in one ah. individual who was a diabetic, and he took about 10 drops on his skin, and he had a hypoglycemic episode. Well, that's very peculiar. I had never seen that before, but I've been doing it with some other people, and they've been using the crunches, the edible cookies, and the topical oil to regulate their blood glucose to, to some benefit. That's very interesting. Okay. And one other thing is I want to mention is that beta carotene improves the sleep. Now, it energizes you. And this is this is a paradox because when you take it, you generally get energized. You get a warmth of the face and the chest, and you feel like you want to get organized. You want to get your task oriented. Your vision enhances. But later on at nighttime, when you're making that transition, you will go to sleep and you'll sleep better than you have before, longer and deeper uh, as a result. And you're not afraid that somebody's going to end up eating two or three of those crunches or four because they like the feeling and they want more of it. I'm not afraid at all. I've had people take uh, three milliliters of the 30 milligram per milliliter uh, function, and they do that regularly. I've had one lady to, who was taking one to two milliliters uh, four times a day and have ended up controlling her blood pressure after she got off of the beta carotene. I see. It's like if they're taking more and more, then I think, oh, my God, now they can't stop. But you're saying that eventually they should be able to stop. It is most people forget to take ah, it. They, okay. you know, there's entirely forgettable. If you don't have it in your phone as a reminder, you'll forget to there's take no it. There's no withdrawal. There's no withdrawal. There's no withdrawal. There's no craving. You just feel pretty good and you forget about using it. Okay. Okay, good. What's your impression about big cannabis, the big business now? What's your thoughts about that? Oh, well, I'm discouraged by it. It's become a very generalized and non-personal. I think there's some big players that have gotten into the market and have distorted the quality of the products available. And then that's deteriorating the relationship that we've had with patients. Patients aren't getting the results that they've been promised or suggested, and they don't understand why. And so they're getting turned off by the whole science of the product. And that's disappointing when it has so many potential benefits. All right. Okay. So we always end our talk with a signature question. If you could tell a younger version of yourself about the endocannabinoid system, or maybe about your specific product, what would it be? I would tell myself about the endocannabinoid system and the wealth of opportunity and explanation for almost all diseases uh, that could be had by understanding and acting through the endocannabinoid system. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.